If you were trapped in the middle of nowhere with a crazy old lady trying to hunt you down, what would you do? These up-and-coming mattress actresses wanted a quiet spot to shoot their next spicy home video, but ended up starring in their very own slasher film instead. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the insane senior citizens in X. This woman is about to have the worst night of her career. One day in 1979 at a gentleman's club outside of Houston, Texas, this young woman Maxine is powdering her nose with illegal substances in the dressing room when her boyfriend slash manager Wayne comes in and tells her that it's time to go. After gassing herself up in the mirror, she grabs her things and joins the rest of the group out in the van. They're heading out into the countryside to film an adult movie, but they have no idea that it's going to be the last trip that they'll ever take. On their way out of town, they pass around copies of the script for their shoot, saying how excited they are to make something without having to go through Hollywood, and talking about what they'll do with the money after they finally get their big break. The group pulls up at a small gas station out along the highway, and Wayne and Maxine head in for some groceries while the others wait for them inside the van. Maxine here tells her man that she's eager to get started, complaining that she's tired of struggling to get by, and is ready to live the life of fame and luxury that she thinks that she deserves. To help out with production, Wayne decided to hire this amateur filmmaker RJ and his girlfriend Lorraine, but Maxine makes it clear that she doesn't like the girl, saying that she's too quiet and is always staring at them. Meanwhile, outside, her friend and fellow actress Bobby Lynn gives RJ some advice on how to make the shot more aggressive, while he explains the editing process and records some footage of this guy Jackson pumping their gas. After grabbing their things, Wayne and Maxine join the others out in the van and they get back on the road. Later that afternoon, they come across the scene of an accident where a massive truck has crashed into a cow that was crossing the street. An officer waves them by, and they drive through its splattered guts right past the sheriff who's going to be recovering their bodies just 24 hours later. The crew finally arrives at their destination, an isolated farmhouse at the end of a long dirt road, just as the sun starts to set, and Wayne tells the others to wait for him in the van while he checks in with the owner. Ready to get down to business, Bobby Lynn and Jackson immediately start aggressively making out. Feeling uncomfortable, Lorraine looks at her boyfriend and says, that this isn't what she had in mind when she agreed to help them out, but he insists that they're going to make art and tells her to just give it a chance. Wayne steps across the front porch and knocks on the door, but the owner, an old man named Howard, doesn't recognize him at first, grabbing his shotgun and threatening to shoot him if he doesn't get off of the property. Seeing the confrontation, Maxine reaches for a revolver that they keep in the glove box, but Wayne reassures the man that he's not from the local government and they're only looking for a place to spend the night. After a moment, Howard finally remembers who he is, lowering his weapon and saying that it was never even loaded, just a trick that he uses to scare off unwanted visitors. With tensions smoothed out for now, Wayne and the others start unloading the van, but that's when Maxine notices the old timer's creepy wife, Pearl, watching her from a second floor window, taking their things. The group follows Howard across the field to the rundown shack where they'll be staying. Before they can make it very far, Howard stops to catch his breath, clearly having some trouble breathing, but when Wayne tries to offer him a hand, the old man abruptly brushes him off. Inside, Howard explains that the place was once used as a house for soldiers during the Civil War, and Jackson mentions that he served two tours as a Marine in Vietnam. As they're settling in, Wayne catches him not so subtly eyeing up Maxine, and the old man says that he never mentioned bringing all of these others along. Wayne offers him some extra cash to pay him off, but Howard pockets the money and says that he doesn't like the look of any of them, warning them that his wife is back at the house and saying that they all better behave themselves before he goes. Okay, I know these wannabe movie stars are probably just eager to get started on the artistic achievement of their lifetimes, but the amount of red flags that they're overlooking here is pretty unbelievable. They might be determined to get famous no matter what the costs, but if they're not careful, they're going to end up with their faces printed in the newspapers and on the back of milk cartons instead of lighting up the big silver screen. Anybody with even a little bit of common sense would be hopping straight back in the van and getting the hell out of there 
before it's too late. So let's take a minute to point out some of the warning signs just in case some of you ever find yourself in a similar scenario. The crew here was too busy grabbing beers and junk food to catch on, but the truth is that the trouble started long before they ever got to the old man's house. Horror fans know that if you're ever on your way to an isolated farmhouse out in the country and happen to stop in at a local gas station, then you're gonna wanna take a good look at your surroundings and keep an eye out for anything suspicious because that's probably going to be your last chance to cancel the trip before everything starts to go horribly wrong. Sure enough, this gas station is hiding exactly the kind of red flags that we've all come to expect after studying up on slasher movies. Now, if you look closely, then you'll notice that tacked up on the board behind the counter are not one and not two, but at least four missing person reports from the local area. Something to worry about? You betcha. And that's only the people who've been reported missing. Who knows how many lonely hitchhikers might have gotten picked up by an unassuming truck out on the side of the highway, only to never be seen or heard from again. The only thing that this place needed was a grizzled old attendant who asks them what they're doing out around these parts and warns them that city folks tend to go missing up that there road. I'd still stop in to fill my tank, but only so I'd have enough gas to get me home after I turned around and headed back in the opposite direction. And then we get to the house. Here's a test. What's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of a rundown old farmhouse out in the country somewhere in Texas? If you answered Chainsaw Massacre, then congratulations. You're smarter than these six future meat hook decorations over here. As young adults here in the late 70s, there's absolutely no way that at least one of them hasn't seen old Leatherface getting down to business, especially since RJ is an amateur director. I get that real life isn't a horror movie, at least most of the time anyway, but the ideas for these stories have to come from somewhere, so it's important to use the lessons that they try to teach you to make some smarter decisions than the crew here. That way, someone won't end up making a movie based on what happened to you. So the place looks bad enough on its own. And then out comes Grandpa wielding a shotgun at the first sign of any visitors. Not exactly what you'd call a warm welcome. Besides the fact that he didn't even remember who Wayne was at first, even though they'd just spoken over the phone the other day, he also seems very hostile towards anyone who he thinks might be from the country. What's up with that? Have county officials been coming out here lately to look for someone like maybe one of those missing people from the board back at the gas station? Call me paranoid, but I'd bet that he's got the body of some poor unfortunate hippie hung up somewhere in there right now. And I, for one, would not be sticking around to find out. As soon as he lowered that shotgun, I'd say that I was going to the van to get my things before jumping in the driver's seat and kicking up dust as I peeled out of there as fast as it would take me. But if people are disappearing out here more often than the Bermuda Triangle and paranoid old weirdos packing major heat aren't enough to scare them away, then I guess that creepy old lady watching them from the bedroom window isn't going to do that either. I mean, she's probably harmless, right? I'd even bake them some cookies if they stick around. Sure thing, guys. Good luck with that. Now, this old man made it pretty clear that they aren't welcome guests from the start. And personally, I'd be packing my things and turning back without a second thought. But if these delinquents are really determined to spend the night, then it's definitely time to get prepared in case he tries anything funny. First things first, they need to get Wayne's revolver out of the glove box and make sure that it's locked and loaded. A gun won't do you any good if it's empty and out in the car, and they need to be ready to fight for their lives if things start going bump in the night. They could also pull the van closer to the cabin that they're staying in. That way, they'll be able to keep an eye on it and have the option to make a quick getaway if they need to. Also, the old man leaving actually actually provides them with a great opportunity to sneak around the property and search for anything suspicious. They'd have to be careful that Granny up there didn't catch on to what they were doing and sound the alarm, but the chance to peek in the basement windows and have a look in the sheds while the old geezer's away is just too good to pass up, even if they don't outright see a dead body. Some bloody farm tools, rope, or anything else that looked suspicious would be all that I needed to see before I decided to hit the road. It's common knowledge that there 
players' safety in numbers, so whatever they decide to do next, the most important thing would be to never separate from the group. That way, you'd have friends to back you up and a wide selection of meat shields if the worst case scenario came true. If any trouble starts, then at least they have these old farts outnumbered three to one. So it shouldn't be much of a fight, especially knowing that Jackson here managed to survive two tours in Vietnam. Personally, my advice here is to just shoot what they came to shoot and get out of there before he gets back. Since I'd rather sleep in the van on the side of the road than spend the night at this place waiting to get killed. But the good news is that these whippersnappers are too young and pretty to die, or at least that's what they think. Let's see what happens when that's put to the test. As soon as he's gone, the rest of the group makes it clear that they didn't like the old man's attitude. Lorraine asks if he even knows what they came out here to do, but Wayne says that he doesn't because he thinks that it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. Peeking through the window, he watches as the old man gets in his truck and leaves the property and tells the others that it's time to get down to business now that the coast is clear. While the others are busy shooting their first scene, Maxine here goes out for some fresh air and a cigarette. Walking alone through the brush, she eventually makes her way to a dock down by the lake and decides that it looks like the perfect place for some skinny dipping, never noticing the old woman stalking her from behind the trees. The thing is, this creepy grandma isn't the only predator out there either. And while Maxine floats around without a care in the world, a massive alligator starts watching her from across the water. Swimming back towards the dock, she still has no idea that the gator is closing in right behind her, pulling herself up just in time without ever knowing just how close she came to getting chomped. On her way back to the shack, Maxine notices the old lady watching her from the front porch, and she motions for her to come over before turning and walking inside. Pulling open the screen door, she calls out to the woman, but by now, she's nowhere in sight. Still, the girl cautiously walks inside and into the kitchen, where she notices that the place is full of dirty dishes and bad vibes. Just then, the old woman reappears in the doorway behind her, offering her a glass of homemade lemonade. Not wanting to offend her, Maxine takes a seat at the table and chugs down the whole glass, saying that she should get back to the others before anyone starts to get worried. As they're walking towards the front door, Pearl stops to admire some pictures of her and Howard on their wedding day, reminiscing about the days when she was all so young and beautiful. In the past, she'd been a dancer, but Howard had to leave her to serve in both world wars. While she stayed home and looked after herself, before they knew it, the days of their youth had passed them by, and they'd both grown old and sick. Standing between her and the door, Pearl tells Maxine to look at herself in the mirror, and while she's distracted, the old woman reaches out and lightly touches her side. Maxine immediately gets uncomfortable, but before she has time to confront her, Howard pulls up in his truck, and Pearl tells her that she needs to leave. Sneaking out through a side door, Maxine watches as the man carries some groceries inside, and she makes a break for the others as soon as he's out of sight. Looking over her shoulder as she runs, she ends up crashing right into Wayne, who shouts at her that it's time for her scene. Maxine here is still shaken by the whole experience, but after shutting herself in a bedroom to gather her thoughts and indulge in some more illegal substances, she manages to compose herself enough to get back to work. Meanwhile, back at the house, Howard carries some groceries into the pantry and notices the two lemonade glasses sitting on the kitchen table. Upstairs, Pearl is sitting in front of the mirror, brushing out her thin strands of hair and putting on blue makeup that looks exactly like Maxine's. The crew sneaks into the barn to film their next scene, but they have no idea that the whole time that they're recording, the creepy old woman is watching them through the window. Once they're finished, Pearl heads back to her house and starts trying to get romantic with her husband, but he pushes her off, saying that he can't do anything too strenuous because of his heart condition, leaving her there feeling alone, undesirable, and jealous of the other girl's youthful good looks. Later that night, the crew gathers around in the front room for some sandwiches and beers. When Maxine catches Lorraine staring at her and Wayne, she wants to know if they think it's strange for Maxine to be sleeping with other men when the two of them are supposed to be a couple, and they respond that as long as the camera's on, then it's it's just business.
business, like acting in a movie. Confused, Lorraine asks them how they can love each other and still be with others. And this time, it's Bobby Lynn who explains that they just want to enjoy themselves while they're young and happy, and life's too short to spend it following outdated traditions. Celebrating their hard day's work, they raise a toast to the perverts of the world for paying their bills. Jackson plays them a song on his guitar. While back at the house, Pearl takes off her makeup and lays down in bed alone. Just then, Lorraine announces that she wants to do a scene in the movie, which shocks everyone in the room, and most of all her boyfriend, RJ. He immediately shuts it down, asking the others if they put her up to this, but she insists that it's what she wants. RJ here is furious, but Wayne takes him outside and argues that he knows from experience that if she's serious, then she'll do it whether he wants her to or not. He can try to stop her, but if he does, it'll only spiral further out of control. RJ insists that she's not like other women, saying that she's a nice girl, but Wayne tells him that, in his opinion, there's no such thing, before walking back inside. Outnumbered five to one, RJ swallows his pride, grabs his recording equipment, and helps them film the scene. Late that night while everyone's asleep, RJ gets up and takes a shower, crying to himself and unable to get his mind off of what's just happened, until eventually he decides that he's done with the whole production. Storming out of the house, he grabs the keys to the van and starts it up, ready to leave them all behind. But as he's driving away, he nearly runs over the old woman, who's standing there in the darkness in the middle of the road. Stopping the van, RJ gets out to see if she needs some help, but that was his biggest mistake. Without saying a word, the woman leans forward and pulls him in for a hug rubbing his back and trying to kiss him. Horrified and disgusted, RJ pulls away and says that they should go find her husband so that she doesn't get hurt out here all alone. Suddenly, the woman stabs him in the throat with a kitchen knife, causing him to stumble back in shock and fall to the ground where he starts bleeding out in the dirt. Climbing on top of him, she pulls the knife out of his neck and stabs him over and over again, shredding open his neck and covering the front of the van with splatters of blood. That makes one victim down with five more to go. When she's finally finished, the woman slowly picks herself up and dances over his body, like she used to back in the good old days, before grabbing the keys to the van and going off in search of her next victim. Whew, okay, talk about a rough night. RJ might have been the amateur director on the set, but it looks like Granny Pearl's the one making the cuts this time around. So what would you do in this scenario? You're an amateur director looking to make your first big hit, but the shoot of a lifetime quickly turned into the setup for a real life slasher film. Late that night, you decide to hit the road before people start getting shanked. Smart move, but as you're pulling out of the driveway, you run into this old geezer who looks like she's cosplaying as the Crypt Keeper blocking your exit. ruh -roh, we got trouble. My advice, drive right around her, hit the gas, and don't look back. Whatever you do, don't get out to help like RJ here, because remember, you're running for your life, not running a retirement home. She might not seem dangerous at first, but this old lady is out for blood. And honestly, everyone would be better off if you turned her into a prehistoric speed bump before she even had the chance to do any real damage. Unfortunately, RJ walked right into her trap and ended up as the first victim. But what's even worse is that he won't be the last. So the obvious thing that RJ should have done here was to stay in the van and keep on driving. But if he was really that determined to play the Good Samaritan, it might have helped to at least make sure that he wasn't heading straight into an ambush. If he was paying close enough attention, then he would have noticed that Pearl was clearly hiding something behind her back when he first pulled up. In situations like this where you're alone on a creepy old farm in the middle of the night, the safest way to approach any situation is to assume that everyone is out to get you, especially old ladies who don't even look like they know where they are in the first place. It's time to think like a police officer and check her for any sharp objects right away and never let her get too close until you're sure that she's not a threat. If RJ had given her a thorough ocular pat down before going in to lend a helping hand, then he might have caught on to her trick before he caught a knife in his neck. As soon as he realized what was happening, the next step would have been to retreat back to the safety of the van. And if she attacks, then grab onto the hand where she's holding the knife, disarm her, punch her lights out with a swift uppercut, and get the hell out of there before old man Jenkins comes out waving the boomstick. I mean, she's practically a walking fossil after all, so if he somehow managed
managed to get taken out by Pearl without even putting up a fight, then he probably wouldn't have lasted very long once things started to pop off anyway. So maybe this was for the best. Sorry, RJ. Pick better friends next time. Back at the cabin, Lorraine rolls over in bed and notices that RJ isn't there. Worried, she goes through the dark hallways, searching for him, and when she gets to the main room, she sees that the front door is wide open. She nervously goes to look inside, when suddenly Wayne grabs her shoulder from behind and asks her what's going on. She explains that she can't find RJ, but Wayne points out that the van is still in the driveway, so the two of them split up to search for him. Lorraine heads up towards the van, but just before she gets there, Howard turns on the light and steps out onto the porch, saying that he can't find his wife, and asking the girl to come inside and help him look. As he grabs a flashlight from the drawer, Howard tells her that there's another one down in the basement, and asks her to get it so that they can search for Pearl together. Reluctantly, she agrees, and descends down into the dark basement, but that was her biggest mistake. Looking around, she eventually finds the flashlight there by the workbench, but when she goes back upstairs, she realizes that the old man has locked the door from the other side, trapping her in. Terrified, the girl starts yelling and slamming on the door for someone to open it up, but nobody comes. With nowhere else to go, she heads back down the stairs, shining her light around as she looks for another route. That's when she discovers the dead body of a man who isn't from their group hanging up against the wall, and she screams as the reality that she's stuck in a murder house sinks in. Okay, wow. This is an impressive level of stupid. If you're going to end up being held hostage by a guy who was born when the dinosaurs still walked the earth, then you should at least make him work for it. These bozos didn't last two seconds into their search before they broke the survival rule number one, which is never split up. Because without friends around, then you've got no one to use as a meat shield when things start to go horribly wrong. As a matter of fact, I would have woken up everyone else in the cabin to come help us look too, considering that RJ deciding to run off was pretty much all of their faults. With Jackson, Maxine, and Bobby Lynn involved too, then they could have divided into two groups like the gang from Scooby-Doo, giving them the option to cover more ground, while also maintaining the safety of not being alone. The worst part is that Lorraine made it within 15 feet of her boyfriend's dead body before being caught by the old man. The van was clearly moved at least a few yards from the place where they parked it originally, so this should have been a red flag that someone had been messing with it. And if she'd just taken a few more steps to investigate, she would have seen what happened to her man and been able to sprint back to the cabin and wake up the others so that they could come up with a plan to fight back instead of giving the old creeps the chance to pick them off one at a time. Now, once she was inside and Howard told her to go grab the flashlight from the basement, the answer to that should have obviously been a firm no, at the very least. She should have checked to make sure that there weren't locks on the outside of the doorway that he could could easily use to trap her in as soon as she let her guard down. Now that she's trapped, the most important thing to do is search the basement for some tools like a hammer, an axe, or anything else heavy and swingable. Not only could she use it to break through the door, but then she'd also have a weapon to defend herself with if Pops decided to get confrontational. The door looks pretty easy to get through, but it's important to remember that doing so is going to make a lot of noise. So it might be wise to stay calm and wait until she was sure that the old time was out of the house again before she got to work. Alternatively, she could start off by seeing if there's a window or another exit that she might be able to break out of without making as much of a commotion instead. Also, she might be trapped, but she does have the benefit of the basement being in an easily defensible position. If she thinks quickly, Lorraine might be able to booby trap the stairs and prepare for a fight, hiding in the shadows and waiting to ambush Howard the next time that he came down the stairs. He shouldn't be too much trouble to fight as long as she can get the jump on him. And personally, I wouldn't hesitate to put the beat down on an old man if it was what I had to do to survive. Meanwhile, back outside, Wayne decides to search the barn looking for RJ, but accidentally steps right on a nail sticking up through a board on the ground. Falling over in pain, he uses a hanging light to get a better look before pulling the nail out of his foot and slowly gets to his feet, calling for help from anyone who might be nearby. Just then, he notices a shadow pass by the barn door. 
Thinking that it must be RJ or Lorraine, he limps over to the door and crouches down to peek through a small hole, when suddenly, Pearl jams a pitchfork through it, directly into his eyeball, killing him in the blink of an eye. After a moment, the woman comes shuffling into the barn, holding the pitchfork in her hands, stabbing him once more in the back to make sure that he's dead, before covering the body up with some hay. That makes two victims down, with four more to go. Okay, these delinquents are officially dropping like flies. Captain Underpants over here just walked right into that pitch dark barn without even considering for a second that there might be an ambush waiting for him inside. It's common sense to not go walking around barefoot when you can't see what you're stepping on, and definitely don't lean down and put your eyes straight up to a hole in the wall when you're not sure what's on the other side. Oh, here's a tip. If you're ever in a position like this where you see a shadow pass by, but when you call out, they don't answer you back, then chances are high that whoever it was is not your friend. Since he had that hanging light available, Wayne should have used it to get a better look at his surroundings instead of walking right into a trap. He's in a barn, so there must be plenty of improvised weapons lying around that he could have used to defend himself as well. When your opponent is a 90-year-old fossil who can't move faster than one mile per hour, just about the only way that she can take you in a fight is if she has the element of surprise. So be smarter than Wayne here, and don't give her the opportunity. Back at the cabin, Jackson hears a strange noise from somewhere in the darkness and tells Bobby Lynn to go back to sleep while he gets up to check it out. While getting a drink of milk in the kitchen, he notices Howard walking across the field towards the cabin and goes outside to see what's up. The old man tells him that his wife's gone missing, explaining that she gets confused sometimes after dark. Jackson notices that he's carrying his shotgun, pointing out that it looks like a lot of firepower to go searching for an old lady, but he says that it's just in case he runs into any gay out by the swamp. Agreeing to help him look for his wife, Jackson goes back into the bedroom to put some pants on, never noticing that Pearl is actually already inside, watching him from the shadows at the end of the hall as he leaves. Once he's gone, the old woman creeps over to the room where Maxine is sleeping and stands over her in the bed, pulling back the sheets and climbing in next to her. Jackson and Howard head down to the dock and decide to split up to cover more ground. While searching through the brush, Jackson comes across a car with a Texas license plate half buried in the mud just off of the main trail. Starting to get suspicious, he notices Howard's flashlight on the other side of the water and goes to see how he's doing. But when he gets there, he finds only the light buried in the mud with no trace of the old man. Jackson climbs up out of the swamp looking back over his shoulder and jumps with fright when he nearly walks right into Howard standing there in the darkness. The man complains that seeing these young people around makes his wife want to feel young again herself. Their last visitor was the same, but he can't give her what she wants anymore, and they can't understand what it's like to grow old. Confused, Jackson says that they should head back up to the house, but the old man only raises his shotgun, blasting him point blank in the chest and sending him crashing into the water. That makes three victims down, with three more to go. Okay, of all the people who should have sensed when a sneak attack was coming, you'd think that it'd be the guy who survived two tours in Vietnam, right? It's not like there weren't plenty of red flags. That abandoned car out in the mud had hippie stickers all on it, so clearly it didn't belong to the old man. As soon as the old timer snuck up on him and started with that the last person who came out here stuff, it was probably time to wrestle that shotgun away and gain control of the situation. Jackson probably wouldn't have even had to fight him off since any strenuous activity seems to be borderline fatal to him because of his heart condition. If he went for the shotgun before he had a chance to fire, then the old man might have just killed over right there on the spot and saved Jackson the trouble of having to take him out himself. So far, everyone's deaths could have been easily avoided if they hadn't underestimated Howard and his wife. It's only the girls left now, and hopefully they can salvage the situation before they all end up dead. Hearing the commotion outside, Maxine rolls over and realizes that the old woman is laying next to her in bed. Horrified, she screams at the top of her lungs, and Bobby Lynn comes running to see what's going on, almost crashing into Pearl on her way down the hall. Meanwhile, Lorraine starts searching around the basement for some tools 
tools, eventually finding a hatchet and using it to chop a hole through the door at the top of the stairs. Reaching for the lock, she's just about to set herself free when suddenly, Howard shows up and crushes her hand with the butt end of his shotgun, nearly chopping off her fingers. The girl yells out for help, but he tells her that she's only going to make things worse for herself, pointing the weapon at her and ordering her to get back down into the basement and stay quiet before turning on the TV to drown out the sounds of her screams. Taking matters into her own hands, Bobby Lynn decides to go looking for the men down by the swamp, only to find Pearl standing there in the nude on the edge of the dock. Still unaware that she's in danger, the girl runs over and tries to help her out, wrapping a blanket around the old woman's shoulders and asking her if she's alright. Suddenly, the woman reaches back and slaps her hard across the face, insulting her and blocking her path back to shore. Furious, Bobby Lynn gets right in her grill and shouts at her to move out of the way, but that's when the woman shoves her into the lake, and in an instant, an enormous alligator bursts out of the darkness, grabbing her by the head and dragging her beneath the surface as the water turns red with blood. That makes four victims down, with two more to go. Back at the cabin, Maxine washes herself off and notices that everyone else has gone missing. Just then, she hears Howard and Pearl coming up towards the house from the swamp, and ducks back into the shadows just as they come inside to get her. Searching around the cabin, the two old timers can't seem to find her. Howard mentions that he's got a different girl up at the house, but Pearl says that she wants Maxine, because she has something special about her, like the old woman did when she was younger. Sitting down on the bed, she complains that she's tired of never getting what she wants, and asks her husband to make her feel young again. He says that he's worried that his heart won't be able to handle it, but finally he gives in, and they start to make some nasty old people love, never noticing that Maxine is hiding right beneath the bed the entire time. Okay, well, it's pretty gross, but if there was ever a time to fight back, this would be it. The old folks are clearly distracted and disarmed, so you aren't going to get a better chance to catch them with their pants down, literally, than right here and now. Maxine may not know exactly what happened to her friends yet, but she does know for sure that whatever Howard and Pearl are up to, they definitely don't have good intentions. So at this point, she has to do whatever it takes to survive. She's got a clear path straight to the old man's shotgun, and in the position that they're in, one good blast would put both of those psychos in the dirt. There's no way that they could possibly get up in time to stop her, and even if it turns out to be empty, she could still use it as a club to slap them around, like we mentioned before. Howard here would probably have a heart attack at the first sign of a struggle, which would leave only Pearl to contend with, and she looks like she'd get blown over by a strong gust of wind. If it were me, I'd grab that shotgun and end this nightmare right here, because it'd be much easier to deal with with the threat now than spare their lives and give them the chance to get the jump on you later. While the two old timers are good and distracted, Maxine seizes the opportunity to crawl out of the room and run for her life. She tries the van first, but finds that they've already stashed the tires and stolen the keys. A few feet away, she notices RJ's corpse lying there in the dirt, and hears Lorraine screaming for help from inside of the house. So she grabs Wayne's revolver out of the glove box and runs inside. Searching the place, she she finds Lorraine still trapped in the basement and quickly sets her free, telling her to keep her voice down so that the old people won't come back before they can escape. Maxine says that they need to find the keys to their truck and get out of there, but Lorraine is hysterical and won't listen. Shouting that it's all their fault, she runs for the front door, only to immediately get smoked by Howard's shotgun the instant that she steps outside. That makes five victims down, with one more to go. Okay, that's gonna leave a mark. Just when it looked like she was about to be home free, Lorraine here still found a way to get herself killed. I think we all know where this is going. Lorraine, you fucked up. Oh God, where do I even begin? We've already covered how going down into a creepy grandpa's basement without making damn sure that you'd be able to get back out wasn't exactly the brightest move. So after falling for one of the oldest tricks in the book, you might think that you'd take a good look at how you ended up in this situation and started making smarter decisions from that point on. But that's just not your style, is it? Even when you had a genuinely good idea, like finding that ax to chop your way out, somehow you still managed to screw everything up. Next time, it 
might help to make the hole on the side of the door that's actually close to the locks. That way you wouldn't have to reach all the way across and expose yourself to a counter attack. I mean, seriously, you could clearly see what side the handle was on from your end, so I'm struggling to understand how the hell you blew it so badly here. Getting your fingers crushed definitely looks like it hurts, and I don't blame you for needing a minute to collect yourself before making another escape attempt. But right after he attacked, the old man just up and left to go after your friends, so there was no reason why you should have sat there crying for the next 15 minutes. Instead of, you know, just reaching out again and opening the door as soon as he was gone. Hello? Are you really just going to let that hard work go to waste and sit there helplessly waiting for him to come back? That's just embarrassing. Well, lucky for you, Maxine had some better survival skills and came along to set you free. This is the part where you shut up and listen to what she says so that you can both make it out alive, right? Wrong. Instead, let's sprint out through the front door screaming and drawing all kinds of attention and run right into a wall of lead. Great strategy. I can't believe that it didn't work out for you. Out of everyone who's been killed so far, you definitely had the most opportunities to escape, but somehow managed to drop the ball every single time. When you're so bad at survival that you wind up dead inches from the finish line, even after your friends did all the work for you, Lorraine, you fucked up. Maxine ducks around the corner, hiding as she listens to the old people say that they're going to bring the bodies inside so that it looks like self defense and feed them to the gators out in the lake after a day if nobody comes looking. The couple drags Lorraine's mangled corpse inside, but suddenly the girl gasps, shocking Howard so badly that he starts to have a heart attack. The man collapses to the floor, and that's when Maxine comes around the corner brandishing her gun and demanding that Pearl hand over the keys to their truck, which she says are in the kitchen. As she comes back from grabbing them, the old woman stands up to confront her, but when Maxine tries to fire the revolver, she sees that it was never loaded. Okay, this is not exactly ideal, but Maxine's come too far to blow it now. Note to self, always make sure that the gun is loaded before you actually need it. Now, her best option here is to just go straight for the shotgun, since it's pretty much the only way that the old lady can put up a fight without the element of surprise. Whatever you do, you do not want to let her get it first. Just thinking ahead a little bit right now, it could actually be helpful to leave Pearl alive if she can. That way, her story would be more believable once the police get involved. But right now, the most important thing here is to do whatever it takes to survive. The good news is she's old and slow, so it should be no trouble for Maxine to dive over there and either get the gun or knock Granny out before it's too late. Pearl goes for her husband's shotgun and shoots at her, but Maxine dodges out of the way just in time. And the blast is so powerful that it sends the old woman flying out through the front door, shattering her hip from the fall. With both threats eliminated, Maxine walks out of the house and over to the old woman who starts begging her for help. Instead, she raises a finger to her lips and tells Pearl to be quiet, climbing into the truck, throwing it in reverse, and driving straight over her head, before speeding off towards the highway as the sun starts to rise. That makes five victims and two insane senior citizens down with one survivor left standing. The next day, the sheriff and his deputies arrive to look over the crime scene and watch as the coroner loads the bodies into the car. One of the officers finds RJ's camera inside the cabin, asking him what he thinks is on it, and the sheriff responds that, by the look of this place, it must be some kind of messed up horror film. But what would you do? If you and your friends drove out into the country in the 70s to make a, a special movie and found out that the old people who let you crash there were suspiciously creepy, would you hurry up and get it over with and then bolt? Or would you investigate and find out what the hell the old people care about you so much for? Let us know down in the comments below. Check out the How To Beat playlist for more videos just like this, and be sure to like and subscribe. Also check out the new series, The Kill Plan, which just dropped on the channel. It's dope. We'll see you guys in the next episode and have a damn good day.